Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, interdisciplinary colloquium. It is my very great pleasure today to introduce Professor Jim Castings. Jim is Evan Pugh University Professor at the Penn State uh, University in the Department of Geosciences. Jim did his AB from Harvard, uh, PhD at, oh, just over the lake over at Michigan, and did postdoctoral work over at NCAR and NASA Ames. He's a world expert in atmospheres and all processes connected to them, both on Earth and on other worlds. Some of his research highlights include the translation of the sulfur mass independent fractionation records into robust constraints on Archean oxygen levels, so the timing and uh, magnitude of the, of the great oxidation event, constraints on atmospheric synthesis of a wide variety of prebiotic reagents, so how exactly could the atmosphere have helped or hindered the origin of life, and that um, foundational work on exoplanet biosignatures, particularly projecting potential biosignatures like methane to planets orbiting different kinds of stars like M dwarfs. And perhaps uh, the most famous of all, the enunciation of the habitable zone, which guides all of our subsequent searches for, for exoplanets, and in particular, our efforts to identify habitable exoplanets. Uh, we're very grateful that Jim has uh, con uh, consented to speak to us today, and we'd love to hear what you have to say, Jim. OK, thank you, Sukrit, for that introduction. And thank you all for inviting me. As we were just discussing uh, before everybody else got on, you actually invited me a year ago to give this talk. And uh, the invitation came in February, and then COVID hit in March. And so uh, this has been delayed. But I'm delighted to have a chance to finally give this talk. Um, everybody see that? Yep. All right, so the uh, talk today is on the search for life on planets around other stars. And uh, it's got four parts which sounds like it'd be a long talk, but I'll try to keep, keep it short. And the, the first part will be very short. It's on the basic requirements for life. I find I always need to state that. I will talk about the definition and boundaries of the habitable zone. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about important recent developments, although some of you are, are probably more up on recent developments than I, I am. And then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the future. And actually, I'm hoping to learn maybe more about the future from you in the discussion than, than I know myself. Let me start with the requirements for life. Uh, I think there's three that most of us would not uh, argue about. You need a planet with a liquid or a solid surface, no gas giants. And why is that? Well, it's because uh, you know, Carl Sagan had proposed floaters in the Jovian atmosphere that could adjust their uh, altitude to maintain the right temperature and pressure, but that would be a highly evolved creature. I think to get life started, you need a stable pressure temp temperature environment, and for that you, you need some kind of surface. You need a thermodynamic free energy gradient to drive metabolism and growth. Uh, that's available in a wide variety of different ways for surface life. Uh, most of that free energy ultimately comes from stellar radiation. And I'm gonna be focused on surface life here as I'll explain later. So that's not really a, a big limiting factor. Uh, I'm gonna assume that life is carbon-based elsewhere and that may or may not be right, but it's, it's very likely if you, you know, there's lots of good biochemical reasons why carbon is used for life. And you probably also need the other uh, bioessential elements which we call schnapps. So, so that's a practical assumption, which may prove ultimately to be incorrect, but I'm gonna use that for this talk. Now, the uh, fourth requirement for life that I'm gonna, you know, that the uh, talk is actually focused on is liquid water. And, you know, this, this where, you know, I get the most pushback from astrobiologists because there are astrobiologists who are interested in looking for life on Saturn's moon Titan, which has liquid methane instead of liquid water. For astronomers uh, looking at exoplanets, it's going to be really difficult if we see a, something that looks like Titan to figure out what the life signals are. In fact, uh, you know, we can look at Titan telescopically or with spacecraft uh, from Earth. And um, you know, we can't really tell much looking at the top of its atmosphere we, the Huygens probe got us down to the surface and Dragonfly is going to fly around on the surface. And eventually, uh, my friend Jonathan Lenine uh, at Cornell would like to fly a boat 
or fly a boat, uh, sail a boat on a Titan and sample the, the uh, methane lakes. So, so for life like that in our own solar system, we can test it. For exoplanets where we just have remote observations, you know, it's probably safest to assume we need liquid water and we need surface liquid water. And why is that? Well, uh, you know, you, you may have uh, subsurface liquid water on planets like Mars or on um, moons like Ju Jupiter's moon Europa, but that again is really difficult to detect remotely. So, so that's why we're gonna, you know, I'm gonna focus on planets like Earth that have surface water, uh, water at their surfaces. All right, that leads to the definition of a parameter that the astronomers are all familiar with, eta sub Earth, which is the fraction of stars that have at least one rocky planet in their habitable zone. And that is the reason the astronomers use this term is that's what they need to know to design space telescopes to look for such planets around nearby stars. And that's what I'll finish up with in this talk today. And I'll make a point now that I'll come back to later. Uh, we should be conservative when calculating eta sub Earth for this purpose because we don't wanna undersize our space telescopes. And actually people seem to be doing the right thing from everything that I've been able to follow. So that, that's actually probably the, the most useful uh, aspect of the habitable zone is that you can use it for these design studies. All right, that leads to part two, which is the definition and boundaries of the habitable zone. I thought for a long time that the term was introduced by Shushu Wang in the 1950s, but I learned just a few years ago, uh, Ralph Lorenz, who's a planetary scientist, uh, found a reference to the term uh, habitable zone in this 1913 book by uh, Walter Maunder, uh, Are the Planets Inhabited? Some of you may recognize Maunder's name. He's uh, famous, his name has been uh, associated with the uh, the Maunder minimum, the discovery that, uh, or the, the historical discovery that sunspots may have been absent between uh, 1630 and 1700, if I, if I remember correctly. And Maunder didn't term, uh, create that term. It was coined by Jack Eddy, a, a solar physicist at uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in a 1976 paper in science. I gave this talk at NCAR uh, last year and uh, uh, mentioned this. Uh, some of the older folks there still remember Jack Eddy talking about this. Here's a picture of Maunder and his wife, uh, Annie Maunder. The quote that is in the book says, the planets revolving around these million suns, stable and efficient suns, can, can we expect that in more cases than one in a hundred, there will be a planet in the habitable zone fulfilling all of the other conditions of habitability of size, mass, inclination of axis, circular orbit, and rotation. And so that was, uh, you know, was actually interesting to me to discover this. I also learned from Lorenz's paper that a lot of Maunder's work was actually done by his wife, Annie Maunder. Uh, but in those days, they didn't give much credit to women being in science. So she, she did a lot, about half the work and uh, Walter or Edward Walter Maunder got most of the credit for it. Um, where, when I was first exposed to this term was actually in graduate school when I was in Michigan in the late 1970s. During that time, two papers came out by a planetary astronomer named M Michael, Michael Hart, who was at NASA Goddard. And he defined the term habitable zone or reused the term. Uh, he defined that as the region around a star in which an Earth-like planet can maintain liquid surface, liquid water on its surface at some instant in time. But he also defined a second term, which, which I find useful, and that's the continuously habitable zone or CHC, which is the region uh, in which a planet can remain habitable for some specified period of time, which we usually take to be 4.6 billion years for our own solar system. And the reason you need these two terms is, as all the astronomers know, uh, all stars brighten as they age. 
um, M stars very slowly. So it's not very significant for M stars, but a star like the sun, the sun was 30% less bright when it formed and it'll uh, stay on the main sequence for another 5 billion years, at which time it'll be two or three times brighter than today. So that means that if the habitable zone at some time T0 went from say this inner circle out to here, where my pointer is, then at some later time T1, it would uh, be farther out going say from here to here, then the overlap between those two regions is the continuously habitable zone. And that obviously depends on the time period that you specify for a planet to remain habitable. There's over the past few years, there's been some controversy about the term habitable zone. Some people don't like it because not all planets within the habitable zone will necessarily be habitable. And I agree with that. Um, but uh, you know, there's there's been lots of terms uh, suggested here. Uh, Harlow Shapley, the famous astronomer, uh, had a 1953 book where he had the concept in in there, and he called it the liquid water belt, uh, which doesn't really have that much of a ring to it. It's been called the ecosphere, the Goldilocks zone. Francois Forget over in uh, LMD in Paris has called it the hunting zone and because that's where we might hunt for habitable planets. The only problem with that as I see it is that we're also interested in looking for intelligent life. And if we find that and they're in the hunting zone then that has bad connotations. So I think that's a, an Achilles heel for that term. And then finally, uh, Elizabeth Tasker, a young astronomer who's over at ELSI in, in Japan has a uh, written a book recently where she calls, she complains about the term habitable zone for the reason that I just told you, and she calls it the temperate zone. But, you know, my response would be not all planets within the habitable zone are actually going to be temperate either. So uh, anyway, it's, it, it's quibbling, regardless of what you call it, we're all talking about the same concept of having liquid water on a planet's surface. Back to Michael Hart's uh, calculations. This is what got me interested as a graduate student. He wrote two papers uh, with a rather simple model for it. And in the first one, he con concluded that the 4.6 billion year continuously habitable zone around our sun is quite narrow. You could get in his model, the Earth would experience a runaway greenhouse that started inside of 0.95 astronomical units, and it would uh, experience runaway glaciation if it started farther than 1.01 astronomical units. Uh, I'll show you in a moment that his inner edge is actually, we, our, our inner edge is the same as Hart's, uh, but the, our outer edge is much farther out and I'll explain why. Uh, Hart wrote a second paper where he applied this same model to planets around other types of main sequence stars and you know, the model was tuned in the first place to work for Earth or for the sun. Uh, and so not surprisingly, it, it, it worked even more poorly for other stars. And so the corollary, which was, uh, you can still find, if you look in old astronomy textbooks, the pessimists all picked up on this because the corollary to this is that Earth might be the only habitable planet in our galaxy. So I read this as a, graduate student and you know I was somewhat dismayed because Carl Sagan was you know popular at the time and appearing in you know cosmos and writing books in fact one of my first books that got me interested in this whole subject was intelligent life in the universe by Shiklovsky and Sagan and Sagan of course was very was an optimist so I was I was discouraged that Hart you know Hart was so pessimistic and I vowed to work on this problem myself and see if I could poke any holes in his theory. There are problems with Hart's model. The biggest one actually is that he concluded incorrectly that a fully glaciated planet could never deglaciate by building up CO2. And you know, if you fully glaciate it, then uh, the surface albedo is, can go up depending on how clean the ice is. And uh, in his greenhouse model, CO2 could not get you, CO2 and water vapor could not allow you to escape. But even at the time, there were five or six different greenhouse 
models available and he picked the, the weakest one. So today all of our 1D calculations and 3D calculations show that if you, you, you can glaciate the, the earth and uh, you can escape from it with high CO2. In fact, there's good geologic evidence that the earth actually has gone snowball two or three times in its history and it's escaped by uh, buildup of CO2. Um, in fact, you see that because there's capped carbonates on top of the glacial deposits in Namibia, for, in, for instance. Uh, there is a, a good reason why CO2 should build up, and that's something I've worked on, uh, on and off for a long time. Uh, CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere is controlled by the carbon cycle, but it's, uh, it's not the part, of the, the part of the carbon cycle that most people are familiar with is the organic carbon cycle where CO2 and water are used by plants in photosynthesis to make organic matter and oxygen, and that's reversed by respiration and decay. But uh, that's a fast part of the carbon cycle and it controls the oxygen level in Earth's atmosphere. But we think that on long time scales, the CO2 content of the atmosphere is actually controlled by the inorganic carbon cycle, also called the carbonate silicate cycle. That cycle is illustrated by this cartoon here. If we start on the left, CO2 dissolves in rainwater to give you carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. It's the acid in soda pop, so you can drink it and it doesn't hurt you too much, uh, but it's strong enough to dissolve silicate rocks on the continents represented here by the mineral calcium silicate. Uh, calcium silicate plus two CO2s plus a water, you can think of that as one CO2 plus carbonic acid, goes to calcium ions plus bicarbonate plus dissolved silica. And those products of weathering, it's silicate weathering is the process, those products collect in uh, groundwater and flow in streams and rivers down to the ocean where various organisms use them to make shells out of calcium carbonate. Uh, then when those organisms die, they fall down to the deep, into the deep ocean. Most of them redissolve because the deep ocean is a little more acidic than the surface ocean. But some of this calcium carbonate accumulates on the seafloor. And then as we know, uh, the seafloor isn't just sitting there, it's spreading, being created at the mid-ocean ridges and spreading away and at some plate margins. Seafloor is subducted, the carbonate sediments are carried down at higher temperatures and pressures, you get a process that occurs, which is called carbonate metamorphism, whereby calcium carbonate and calcium magnesium carbonates recombine with silica, which by this time is the mineral quartz, to reform calcium and magnesium silicates and release gaseous CO2, which then comes back to the atmosphere through volcanism. So then if you think about how this works, uh, to help stabilize the climate. Suppose you do go into a snow, snowball earth uh, as the earth seems to have done. Uh, you freeze over the oceans and that stops, pretty much stops the hydrologic cycle. You may have a little bit of sublimation from the ice, a little bit of snowfall on the land, but you need liquid water to make these silicate weathering reactions go at any rate. So, so the simple story is that uh, if you do freeze over the oceans, then volcanic CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere. It looks here like the volcanism would cease too, but that's really an illusion because there's 70 million years of uh, carbonates built up on the seafloor. The average lifetime of seafloor is about 70 million years. So you've got a long supply of carbon going down subduction zones. There's also point volcanism in places like Hawaii where you have CO2 coming directly out of the mantle. So, so we think that CO2 you know, would build up and eventually uh, thaw the ice. Uh, you don't have to go to that extreme though. When the climate cools, the silicate weathering slows down and CO2 builds up. When the climate warms, uh, silicate weathering increases, CO2 goes down. So that stabilizing feedback mechanism is important in solving what's called the faint young sun problem on earth. How did earth remain habitable when the sun was less bright and it's also the key to, to our theories of the habitable zone. There's a caveat that I should mention briefly that uh, if you have a, pl a planet 
that has a low volcanic outgassing rate or that is near the outer edge of the habitable zone and receives less sunlight than Earth, you can, instead of getting a stable warm climate, you can get a, a limit cycling type behavior where the climate oscillates between uh, snowball conditions and, and warm conditions with liquid water. And this was actually shown a long time ago by the Japanese uh, scientist uh, Aichi Taijika. And there's papers by him. I, well, it wasn't brought to my attention or I, I didn't realize it until Kristen Manu from University of Toronto wrote a paper. And uh, we, we did our own study and found that there, you know, these, these guys are totally right that there is a regime where you can get limit cycling instead of uh, warm, stable climates. And we can argue about how habitable so those type of planets are. All right, well, if you put all this together, this leads to, uh, you, you can use this to define a habitable zone. This is an old figure, which is based on calculations that I published back in 1993. The idea then is that, you know, I, as I said, the inner edge of the habitable zone, we think Michael Hart's models were actually pretty close to being correct. But it, as a, if you push the planet, Beyond, uh, away, beyond the Earth's orbit, then this carbonate silicate cycle feeds, uh, feedback kicks in. And, and so the outer edge of the habitable zone in our models is much farther out. This blue, uh, here we were showing uh, the habitable zone in blue as a function of distance in astronomical units and the mass of the star on the vertical scale. The more massive stars are much brighter so the habitable zone is farther out. Uh, it's, it's closer in around uh, K stars and red dwarfs. Back, this is, if you're gonna show a diagram like this, uh, in, in terms of distance, you have to pick a particular time in the lifetime of the star because the habitable zone is moving with time at different rates for different stars. So this is the zero age main sequence habitable zone for these different types of stars. You can see that uh, Earth, we're the third rock from the sun back at 4.6 billion years ago when the sun entered the main sequence, the Earth was right in the middle of the habitable zone as we define it. As I'll show in a moment, the Earth is now closer to the inner edge, not because the Earth has moved, but because the habitable zone has moved outward with time. All right, there are limits to how far that feedback can go, at some point, if you push the planet too far away from the sun, the CO2 starts to condense. In fact, you can see that on Mars today, CO2 condenses in the polar region. So they're part, they're part of the polar ice caps. Even in a one dimensional model, if you go too far out, the CO2 condenses and that actually sets a limit, which I'm not gonna go through the details because I don't wanna take too much time on it, but you can show even in 1D that you get something called the maximum greenhouse limit for a CO2 water atmosphere, which we get to be out at about 1.67 AU for a sun-like star. Remember Mars is at 1.52 AU. So actually Mars is within the habitable zone in our calculations, but of course it's, it's not habitable, at least at the surface. And that's not because Mars, you know, of the insulation that Mars gets, but it, it's too small, it doesn't have enough atmosphere left and, and volcanic activity to sustain it. So that makes Elizabeth Tasker's point that not all planets in the habitable zone will be habitable. The inner edge, uh, the problem is just the opposite, of course, the, the solar insulation or stellar insulation is higher than that at Earth. And you, so a planet can develop either uh, a runaway or a moist greenhouse uh, these are slightly different versions of the same concept. It's too high. Uh, the temperature is too high. In the runaway greenhouse, the oceans evaporate entirely. In the moist greenhouse, the oceans remain liquid, but the, the surface temperature increases. You get a lot, lot of water up into the stratosphere, and then that water can be fertilized by solar UV, and uh, hydrogen escapes to space. So our old limit from this uh, 1993 paper that I worked on a long time ago, the inner edge was at 0.95 AU, right where Michael Hart had it. And it was kind of accidental because our models were entirely different. 
that inner edge changed with time. The outer edge has stayed mostly the same, but Colin Goldblatt at University of Victoria published a paper in 2013 where he, he did some one-dimensional di one climate modeling, uh, but he used new and better absorption coefficients uh, for CO2 and water vapor. And especially for water vapor, it makes a huge difference. Uh, most, of, most of our, in fact, my old 1993 models use band, band models. They were really archaic uh, absorb parameterizations of absorption coefficients. Most climate models these days use the HITRAN database, which, uh, which was developed by the Air Force initially. It, was, it used to be called the AFGL tapes and it developed into the HITRAN database. Uh, Colin, that, that, and that's based on a mixture of theory and experiments, laboratory experiments. Colin used the high temp database, which is a strictly theoretical database calculated with quantum mechanical models. And as all of you are aware, uh, computers have gotten much faster over the last 30 years. And uh, th th you can now do ab initio quantum mechanical modeling much to a much greater in much greater detail than you used to be able to. So uh, it turns out that when you do that and calculate the absorption co uh, spectrum for water vapor, water vapor absorbs not just in the infra thermal infrared, but all the way down through the visible and into the UV. It's, the absorption is weak, so it wasn't, hadn't really been measured, still hasn't, I don't think, in the lab, but uh, it's predicted to be there. And that affects the, when you get a dense water vapor atmosphere, that affects the albedo. So this just shows over here on the right, this was, uh, this was our 1993 model, which actually came from my 1988 paper. And so that when you get a thick steam atmosphere, the asymptotic albedo at high temperatures in the old model was about 0.35. With the new high temp database, Colin showed that the albedo is half of that, 0.17. So the, planet's albedo, this is without even thinking about the clouds yet. So uh, even without worrying about the clouds, the planet absorbs more sunlight and so the inner edge moves outward. All right, so then, uh, you know, once we read that paper, our group got interested in it. I had a postdoc, Ravi Kaparapu at the time and a graduate student, Ramses Ramirez, and we went back and derived coefficients with some help from Francois Forger's group. Uh, we used the high temp database ourselves and re-derived our absorption coefficients. And then we recalculated the habitable zone here. And uh, the, the habitable zone moved out, in fact, uncomfortably far out. Uh, with the new, our new model, the earth was sitting right on the inner edge. The inner edge of the habitable zone moved out to one AU. And we don't really, we knew that wasn't right, but we also knew what was wrong. We, we were assuming fully saturated atmospheres, uh, relative humidity of one in the troposphere, basically because you can't do much better than that in 1D. You really need to go to 3D to do that. And so we, we were overestimating the amount of water vapor in the troposphere. Well, how do you solve that problem? You go to 3D. And uh, fortunately, several groups have been doing this now. Uh, computers are fast, and people have, have put a lot of effort into this, especially uh, Francois Forger's group at LMD, the Laboratory Mont de Globe in Paris. These are some calculations done by Jeremy Leconte from that group. Uh, what, what he's showing here are, uh, is relative humidity from a three, calculated by a 3D model here. Notice that this is latitude on the x-axis and altitude on the y-axis. Those of you who are meteorologists know that the Earth has Hadley cells. There's rising air at the equator and descending air at 20 or 30 degrees latitude. Uh, and the descending branches of the Hadley cells, that's where the deserts are today. The air loses most of its moisture on the way up and it, it's dry, dry on the way down. Uh, and so those, those unsaturated regions out here act as radiator fins because the outgoing infrared radiation can be guided through that. And this, this wasn't actually their idea. It actually came from a paper back in 1995 by Ray Pierre Humbert 
who I bet some of you know, because his wife, Janet Pierre Humbert, was a professor in linguistics there at Northwestern for many years. And uh, Ray was a professor at University of Chicago. They both now moved on to Oxford. But uh, Ray had figured this out in a paper where he was actually asking the question, why, do, why don't the tropics, Earth's tropics, go into runaway greenhouse? This was one of the reasons, the other reason, of course, being that the tropics can ex export heat to higher latitudes. All right, well, there, uh, some, some people just don't trust the theoreticians. I've, I'm a theoretician and I always get pushed back. There are people that are empiricists, so you can also look at other planets in our solar system and try to define limits on the habitable zone that way. Here's a picture of Venus taken at radar wavelengths by Magellan many years ago. Uh, there's no evidence for liquid water having been on Venus's surface. We think the surface is between a half billion and a billion years old. And Venus may have had water at one time. Michael Way at NASA GIST thinks it did, but uh, it hasn't had it for the last uh, billion years. So that can be used to place a limit, an empirical limit on the inner edge. Mars, by, uh, by contrast, it, early Mars was outside the habitable zone in our models, and yet there's all these fluvial features on it. So Mars beats our habitable zone by a little bit, and we can use that to define an empirical outer edge. All right, so then if you put that together, these were new calculations that we published. Ravi Kaparapu was the first author. So this was the updated habitable zone using those new absorption coefficients. And what we did then is we, we corrected the inner edge uh, according to the 3D calc calculations from the Leconte model, because their inner edge was right back to 0.95 AU again, which is where Michael Hart had it back in the late 1970s. So now we've changed the diagram here, mainly because we wanna be able to show exoplanets which have been discovered. So instead of using distance as the x-axis, this is the amount of starlight on the planet relative to the amount on Earth. And on the y-axis, we've got stellar effective temperature instead of mass. So what this does is this expands the habitable zone so you can see more of the interesting objects that are there. Here's Venus, Earth, and Mars in our solar system. The yellow, the yellow curve is the runaway greenhouse limit. The blue curve is the maximum greenhouse limit. The red curve is the uh, red and orange curves are the empirical recent Venus and early Mars limits. And these other objects in here are various exoplanets that have been discovered mostly by Kepler. And I, I have a more up-to-date diagram, so I won't belabor this one. What you, what you can do then, and what we have done, is you can say there's a, we can define a conservative habitable zone based on the theoretical calculations, which goes from the runaway greenhouse to the maximum greenhouse limit. And you can define a more optimistic habitable zone that goes from these empirical limits. And you know, the, it doesn't change the outer edge much, but in log space that, uh, that actually doubles the, side, the width of the habitable zone and all of these potentially habitable planets become uh, candidates, right? So, what, so what, we, what I argued at the beginning is that when you're designing big space telescopes, you wanna use the conservative habitable zone. And fortunately, people have been doing that using the big space telescopes that they have been designing. All right, so recent developments, I'll go through this very quickly because most of these are well known to this audience. Uh, Kepler was an amazing success. Uh, it was up there, it was launched in 2009, did its main mission between then and 2013, looking for transits around, transits of stars around 160,000 stars. Kepler's main goal was to calculate the value of Eta sub Earth. And they did a pretty good job of it, actually, uh, although not as good as you would have liked, because you really need three transits to get uh, know you've got a planet. And so if you have a planet like the Earth that uh, transits once, at, once a year in a four-year mission, you only get three transits, basically. So it's really 
minimal for getting aetis of Earth around sun-like stars. Early on, by 2015, they had a pretty good value for M stars, published by Dressing and Charbonneau, that aetis of Earth was about 0.2 for M stars. As far as I know, that limit has stood up. Uh, for G and K stars, it took a lot of work. And in fact, the, you know, some, some estimates were published early, but the estimates kept changing. The, and finally, what uh, Ravi Kaparapu tells me is the, uh, the, the most definitive group for, uh, uh, estimate from the Kepler Working Group from, it's a, it was just published in January 2021, this year by Bryson et al. And they have big error bars, but th their estimate for G and K stars, the median is about 0.5 which I find really exciting if they're right. Uh, of course, that's, that's big error bars, but they could be right about that. All right, what else have we learned uh, from a combination of Kepler and ground-based observations? If you, if you have radial velocity measurements on Kepler objects, you can get them. Kepler gives you the diameter of the planet, Radial velocity gives you the mass. You know that the orbit is aligned with your line of sight, so you get the true mass. Therefore, you can calculate the density. And the astronomers will have seen this figure before from Weiss and Marcy several years back, that there's a peak in density at something like one and a half Earth radii, probably because these are rocky planets on the inside and they're tending, trending towards gas giants beyond that. There's been more work on this. Uh, I'm familiar with this paper by Fulton et al, which is four years old now, which identifies a radius gap here at around uh, between 1.6 and 2.0 Earth radii. So these are the rocky planets, they would argue, on the inside, and these are uh, ice or gas giants on the outside. Remember, it's only the inner planets, the rocky ones, that we're uh, interested in for this talk. Um, second thing, we the uh, radio velocity folks from Harp South found a planet around Proxima Centauri B, close to us. It's in the habitable zone, uh, and and that's very exciting. Actually, you can potentially look at that. Uh, it doesn't transit, but you can look at that from the ground with uh, big big ground based telescopes that are being built, and then. Third, uh, there's the TRAPPIST-1 system, which the astronomers, again, are very familiar with. This was published, this was also found by the transit method from ground-based, uh, you know, automated small telescopes, 60 centimeter telescope uh, network uh, with, in Chile. And uh, there's seven, seven planets within the habitable zone of TRAPPIST-1, which is a, a very late M star, I think it's M8. And they're all perfectly aligned and they all transit. So this is a big uh, target now for JWST. Uh, back to this one more time, if you eliminate all the planets that have a radii greater than 1.6 Earth radii, because they're probably not rocky, and if, if you add in the new planets, here's that habitable zone diagram one last time. Uh, here's Proxima Centauri B right down here. Here's four of the seven TRAPPIST-1 planets. Three of them are E, F, and G are in the conservative habitable zone and one out here in the optimistic habitable zone. So those, uh, those will be, uh, the TRAPPIST ones will be big, big targets for J, JWST. And as I mentioned, Proxima Centauri B, you may be able to look at using direct imaging from the ground. All right, then very br briefly on the future, the future is bright. I just don't know how fast things are going to happen. What we want to do, JWST can really only look at transiting planets. It, it's got a coronagraph on it, but it's not good enough to look at Earth-like planets. So we want to do direct image, what's called direct imaging from space. And in direct imaging, you try to block out the light from the star and look for either the reflected light, if you're working in the visible um, and near IR, or emitted infrared radiation if you're working in the thermal IR. And so if you can do direct imaging, then you can see all the planets around here, not, not just the ones that transit. So there, the astronomers have been 
studying two big direct imaging missions as part of the ongoing astronomy and astrophysics decadal survey, which I am not part of, and, uh, but it's, I, I understand it's wrapping up uh, this spring. I, I don't, don't know when the report gets published, but the two that they've been studying are LUVOIR, the Large UV Optical Infrared Space Telescope, which would have an internal coronagraph, sort of looks like JWST, only bigger. There's two sizes. There's a uh, LUVOIR A is 15 meters. Remember the Hubble was 2.4 meters. JW is six and a half meters. LUVOIR A is 15 meters and LUVOIR B is eight meters. So they're both bigger than JW. And then there's a smaller version called HABEX, the Habitable Planets Explorer, which is only, only four meters in diameter, uh, which is just barely big enough to do things on its own, but it might come with a star shade. And so if you find a good target, you can put the star shade out there and actually get a really good spectrum with a four meter telescope. All right, so last thing, what do you look for? You know, there's a whole discussion about biosignatures. I'm just going to mention one because I was suggested many years ago, and I, I still think it's the best biosignature, and that's the simultaneous presence of oxygen and methane. In Earth's atmosphere, these are both produced biogenically. It's, they react with each other. It's really difficult to, to maintain them in high concentrations without having life being present. And then, of course, if you look at a spectrum of the Earth, uh, this is one from Earthshine, where you're looking at the light reflected from the dark side of the moon. Down up here are the data in black. This is a scale in angstrom, so divide that by 10 to get nanometers. The, uh, the visible is from 4,000 to 7,000 angstroms. And what you can see in the Earthshine spectrum is there's a very strong oxygen A band here at 7,600 angstroms or 760 nanometers, which all of these telescopes would be designed to see. You can't see methane uh, at, uh, in, these, in the Earthshine spectra at this resolution because there's not enough methane, but there are times in the Earth's history when there may have been enough methane to see that plus oxygen at the same time. So I um, want to cut it off now. Let me leave you with Three thoughts, one, detectable life requires at a minimum planet with a solid or liquid surface, source of free energy, availability of carbon and surface liquid water. Habitable zones should be defined conservatively uh, if when used to generate design parameters for 3D uh, future space telescopes, and both HABEX and LUVAR have been using our updated habitable zones. And then as I just said, in the long run, both NASA and ESA would like to do direct imaging of exoplanets. And so I'm hoping that the Astronomy and Astrophysics Decadal Survey picks one of them as, a, uh, as the next flagship mission. But maybe uh, some of you probably know more about that than I do. So I will quit there and open it up for questions. Thanks. <laughs>